Good evening, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Hodson. I'm here tonight with my daughter Emily, who as you know is the winemaker at Veritas and we're doing our virtual tasting. This is our number three tasting and uh, as before we'd like to thank everyone who's uh, helped us in our, our quest to remain alive during this Covid crisis and uh, we've been delighted with the uh, community support that we've received. One of the things I love about wine is the fact that one can have a wine made in Virginia, a wine, uh, same grape can be can come from Australia or it may come from South Africa. So one has this different uh, nuance of the same grape from different regions. And tonight, rather than concern ourselves with the different regions from which the grapes come, we're going to talk about the way in which the wine is made. The process, when we make wine, we call it the vinification. And of course, that is the, that is the, 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 the uh, complete um, region of Emily's um, uh, expertise as the winemaker. And tonight, she's going to share with us one of, the, um, one of her innovative uh, uh, ways of making uh, wine with the same grape, the Viognier grape, but we've made that same Viognier grape in a different way using a, a winemaker's technique, which is really very interesting and I want you to enjoy tonight because the wine that she has made, in my opinion, is absolutely terrific. But before we dive into the tasting, we, we wanted to switch up our third lucky number three, live tasting. Um, in our last two, we've been humbled by the amount of questions and support and interest we've had from our live viewers. So we want to integrate you more into our tasting today. So we want to switch the focus over to you. We want to hear questions. Don't wait till the end. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Becca with us who's going to help us uh, field questions and answer questions. And so we want, as I said, we want to switch the focus over to you. We're here to provide the, the base content, which yeah. is Viognier two ways. Um, but uh, I think the fun of it is that we interact and do this together. So please don't be shy. Please don't wait till the end. Please ask your question when it comes up. And I think that will make it more dynamic and more fun. Very good, Emily. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we would like. We want people to engage with us and, and that makes it more enjoyable. So I'm going to start by just quickly reviewing how can I pour the wines while you're yeah sure go okay. ahead please yes. I want to review the fact that we're in the first place drinking Viognier you know why where did this grape come from and why is it so significant to the Virginia wine industry well it originated in France in a particular region of France in the northern Rhone Valley in a, a an area called Condrieux now I say that because you probably know that in France they name the wine after the origin or the place at which the wine is made. And uh, if you walked into a French wine store and said, I would like a bottle of Viognier, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. But if you walked into the wine store and said, I'd like a bottle of Contrieux, which is a place in the Rhone Valley, they'd know exactly what you're talking about. And we've been there. And we've been there mm -hmm. and we've tasted the wines from Contrieux. And then having been to Contrieux, seeing the conditions under which the grapes are grown, which are absolutely totally different to the way the grapes are grown in Virginia, we came back and realized the potential of Viognier in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Now, the person who brought Viognier to Virginia was Dennis Horton yes. of Horton Vineyards, and we owe a, a, a debt of gratitude to him for starting the Viognier ball rolling, mm -hmm. and, um, and we've all of, it, all of Virginia has benefited from the fact that Dennis brought back the Viognier from the Condria region. Right. And from the same trip. From the same trip. Yep. And Emily has taken that grape, uh, I'm going to say taken the, the ball and run with it, or <laughs> taken the grape and run with it, uh, and she's developed a style of Viognier which is very distinct and very different from the French style. And Emily, perhaps you could talk to us tonight about how you have developed that style and 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 how we're going to contrast These your wines. standard style with the innovative wine that you've made. Sure. So one of the things I realized with, with Viognier was that it was a very 
spicy, aromatic, fruit-driven white. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of had a blank slate when we started working with it in Virginia. So you just start looking at what you have to start with. And I couldn't believe the intensity of the fruit. So of course I wanted to maximize that. Um, so I'd say our brand style or our house style is really working on that beautiful acid balance and fruit intensity and, and bringing a, live, a liveliness to the wine. Yes. Um, so we do a little bit of skin contact and really work on you know picking with mm -hmm. good acid mm -hmm. um, and moving forward with that. Yeah. So. That's good, and that contrasts so much with the with the French style, because the French style has um, what I would call a sort of flabbiness to it. And what I mean by that is they often have high alcohol in the wine, and they lose that intensity of flavor. And, and I think that's the one thing that we are able to claim as our as our contribution to the appreciation of Viognier, sure. the way we make the Viognier. Just accentuating its natural character. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, which is absolutely beautiful, mm -hmm. which we're going to get on to when we actually taste the wines. Yes. So that leads us to the point where um, Emily uh, has developed a wine uh, using a, a technique that she, uh, she developed, and I'd like her to explain to us how that technique changes the expression of the Viognier grape that even even supersedes the, the quality of our, our Virginia style. Sure, so you're talking more about the skin contact or? Well, I'm thinking more about the, uh, the way you've made the Viognier with the, with the innovative uh, barrel. Oh, okay, okay. yes, okay. Yeah. I have one yes. question. Somebody's asking Great. if we grow our own grapes. I think that's the perfect place to start. Probably. Absolutely, so both of these wines are estate-grown Viognier. Mm -hmm. wines mm -hmm. absolutely and what i'd like to emphasize is they come from the same blocks they come from this in the same climate they're they're identically grown grapes but the wines are very distinct and very different and that that's what that's that's the enjoyment of the wines and that's what we'd like to ch share with you tonight yeah and i think what what <clears throat> andrew was was kind of um leading me on to explain was is what is the difference between these two wines? So we have um, our classic copper colored label Viognier 2018, and then we have a Club Cuvée. Both Viognier, um, both 100% Viognier. Um, the only difference is, is that the Club Cuvée is fermented in um, acacia wood barrels. Mm -hmm. And so where that came from, the idea and the reason we, we started that project, um, I believe it or not, saw a lot of people in the Loire and in, in Sauvignon Blanc producing regions using acacia barrels with Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we also grow Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to try using acacia and Sauvignon Blanc because from what the literature said, it respected freshness and brought structure, mm -hmm. but you also had your classic fruit character. Um, so I ordered the barrels for a Sauvignon Blanc project. Hmm. Um, in the end, um, uh, because all barrels are very similarly marked, uh, Viognier ended up um, <laughs> being put in those barrels. So I was, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure. Um, it's kind of one of those fate, fatalistic, um, wonderful experiences. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was bummed at first because it was a Sauvignon Blanc project, but I was thrilled with the end pro the end product of, of what Acacia did for Viognier. It just brings that floral freshness back yes, to the yes. wine. Yes, yes. I, I often say that one of the problems with, with an aromatic wine and an aromatic grape like Sauvignon Blanc is that oak actually obscures sure. the very characters that you're trying to bring out. Right. Uh, and, and because oak is toasty. It's not so much what acacia does for the barrel, right. it's what, it's, what it doesn't do right. to obliterate the really wonderful aromatic qualities of the wine and the whole idea is you know the anytime you put wine in oak or in a barrel yeah. you want to build structure yeah but the oak is bringing too much toasting it's yeah. masking the fruit too much exactly mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. and um I, I, and i think that's the, the 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 value that you've found in the acacia mm -hmm. now when i think of acacia and i've heard of acacia i think of flowers i, have, I think I of white flowers, flowers. Yes. And, and i think of white flowers on a bush Mm -hmm. I, I can't conceive that there's a tree 
that you can make a barrel from acacia because when I smell acacia, I think of either hawthorn or mm -hmm. elderflower mm -hmm. or you know all these exotic white flowers sure. that we can talk about. So tell us about the actual acacia uh, wood itself. Sure. So I think, and I, I get this question a lot in the cellar when I'm doing tours, um, and I think a lot of what people think about when they think acacia is the tree that's grown in South Africa, or Australia. Becca, can you see this image okay? Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. So yes. that that is kind of um, falsely associated. This is an actual acacia. Um, the tree that, that we're using for our acacia barrels is a French acacia. Sorry, while I switch my visual. Um, a French acacia is also called a pseudo acacia. And pseudo acacia is actually black locust. Yes. So black locust is actually indigenous to southeast, the southeastern United States. So in some states, it's actually mm -hmm. an invasive species. And since I've been doing my, since I've done my research on acacia um, or black locust, I realized we have six or seven trees of black locust on our farm. So I think the common saying is what grows together goes, goes together, together. <laughs> I love that. what i loved when, when emily and i went through the wines today together was that that we actually agreed that as we smell the aromas of the two wines there's actually more aroma intensity mm. coming from the standard viognier mm -hmm. Emily used a word that I, I love when it comes to describing aromas in wine. She said the, the cuvee wine has re restraint. Mm -hmm. Now that's a term that, that makes you sort of uh, wonder what you're going to taste next because it gives you a, a promise. Right. And, and uh, if you just smoke the two wines side by side, the cuvee has less intensity mm -hmm. of aroma yet the restraint is more alluring. And you, know, and you want to taste this wine. Yes, so with restraint, I think the only way I can explain it is that I smell it on the Club Cuvée, mm -hmm. which has restraint. So mm -hmm. the, the standard Viognier is, is much more intense fruit, and then the Club Cuvée has less intensity of fruit and this restraint, yeah. but you keep going back to it. The reason you keep going back to it is yeah. because you can't really put a finger on what it is yes. in that aroma. And it's so intriguing. And it's so very difficult mm -hmm. to describe aromas because when we describe aromas, we're saying it's like mm -hmm. so-and-so, it's like this, it's mm -hmm. like that. And sometimes there are no words that really enable you to... To, to really come up with, there's no vocabulary right. that, that can it's only, that describe that. It's only your yeah. life experience, yeah. right? And exactly. so we're, we're doing our yeah. best to find our own life experience that we can relate to what we're smelling. So I think the take home message on aroma from the, the standard uh, Viognier to the Club Cuvée with the acacia barrels is that the standard Club Cuvée has a lot of fruit intensity and a lot of wham blam Mm -hmm. um, and the Club Cuvée has a lot of restraint that keeps you coming back and keeps you interested. Keeps you wondering. It keeps yes. you wondering. You're not quite sure mm -hmm. and you want to try it because it's intriguing. Mm -hmm. It's intriguing. It's engaging. Mm -hmm. And now let's taste the wines. Okay. okay well, I'm going to jump in really quick. I'm sure. sorry. We had some technical difficulties. We're so sorry. Facebook kicked us off. Okay. Um, but we do have a few questions. Great. That I, feel I like love we questions. Jump in. Yeah. So just um, really quickly, someone was asking about the, the difference between stainless, maybe, and, and the barrel choice altogether. Oh, sure. Okay. So stainless steel, um, great choice for Viognier because it retains all the freshness. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'm always looking for in Viognier, I want the, the intensity of the fruit to match what you put in your mouth. And so when, I, when I'm thinking about that, I want the intensity of the aromas to match the body of the wine. And body is a hard thing to explain. Mm -hmm. It's the richness, it's the structure, it's the texture, it's how it feels in your mouth. Right. So the first thing you can do to build body is to go into barrel. Mm -hmm. um, the barrel has more tannins. Um, and um, when you're fermenting in a barrel, the whole fermentation is mixing and stirring within those oak tannins and mm -hmm. building structure the mm -hmm. whole time. Um, and I also, with, with barrel fermentation, the added uh, advantage is that 
the the dead yeast the lees are within the wine mm -hmm. and those lees dissolve into the wine this doesn't happen in stainless steel it happens in a barrel and this gives the wine this lovely lovely texture this lovely sort of what we call mouthfeel unctuous uh, unctuous unctuous it's a sort of weird word i think it sort of almost means oily yes. but it's not but it's oily, not oily it's, yeah. got a, it's got yeah. a wonderful texture yep. and it's that that uh lees aging in, in barrel that distinguishes a barrel made wine from a tank made wine sure yep and it's it's all about completing the picture right so viognier does it in, inherently has that fruit structure it does that on its own but in order to sort of to fine tune or focus the picture yes. we want to figure out a way to naturally um, build the final structure of the wine for aging potential and then also just for a, a more well-rounded structured wine yeah. oh, speaking of structure yes um, Donna would like to know what exactly you mean by structure. She hears you speak of that often. Oh yes, okay, Donna. I, I totally understand. I I wish so. Actually, if you have both wines in front of you, that's the best way to do it. It, ha it structure is how it feels in your mouth. So a wine that has very little structure will just you'll you'll put it in your mouth and you'll swallow it, and that's kind of the end of the story. A wine that has structure you can actually feel a slight texture in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And then when you're done drinking it, there's a lingering finish of yeah, that structure yeah, yeah. also. So that's a great question, Donna. Yeah, I also like to talk about structure. I like to use the analogy of music. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a wine that's got structure, you're able to distinguish each of the individual flavors uh, separately rather like a good orchestra you can hear the flutes you can hear the violas everything is well structured they don't they don't uh, interfere with one another mm -hmm. so a structured wine has got this clarity mm -hmm. and also this structure of the palate mm -hmm. which, which is so very very important mm -hmm. and you know in certain barrels Emily and I know that if we use for example a French barrel we're going to get more structure in the wine. Right. If we use an American oak barrel, we're going to get more flavor than structure. Right. Uh, and these are all the nuances that Emily has to deal with in putting together a wine that has the, these wonderful complexities. Um, so maybe this is a good time to talk about Momentarius. Please, yes. Okay, so Club Cuvée, as I said earlier, and actually many of you may have missed it due to technical difficulties. Club Cuvée is a wine we make specifically for our wine club members, um, and it's sort of the intellectual projects we're working on, the fun projects, small batch, just for wine club members. Um, but I just wanted to introduce um, the next thought Drum process roll. on this, which is our Momentarius collection um, and momentarius is um, kind of a moment in time yeah and this is from my brother-in-law Elliot um, we, we were trying to move away from club cuvee and so we were looking at ideas and momentarius seemed like um, sorry I just didn't want it in my no, I love chin. it it's a moment in time it's a moment in time I, I love it's something that. we're yeah. gonna make and yeah. it's an idea that we had or um, we're looking at and it's it's not a production line it's not something we're looking um, to necessarily add to the portfolio, but it's something we want to share with our wine club members. So if you're interested in those projects, um, on our website up on, on the top bar, you can click on wine club and we do three bottle, six bottle, 12 bottle. Um, you name it, you can have yeah, it. Yeah, monthly, <laughs> quarterly, yearly. Um, so then let's get to the, how the wines taste. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. We're talking a bit too much, aren't we? I'm supposed to do club cuvee, you're supposed right. to do. So when I taste this wine, yep. I, the thing I'm most struck with Is that, as Emily said, it's the structure of the wine. The, it's got a very bright, very lovely, bright acidity. And the flavor intensity is huge. Mm -hmm. And it's peach, apricot. I like to say peaches and cream. Mm -hmm. And that the finish, not the finish actually, the end of the palate, one can appreciate this sort of gingery, um, spicy character, which actually, as it, as it lingers on the finish, um, it, it, it's very, very, very nice. Mm. Um, but I know Emily's going to tell us about the, the Club Cuvée, which has got certain. So then the Club Cuvée, subtle as we said, differences. yep, as we said with the aroma, 
um, where it has the restraint. Yeah. Um, what I love about the Club Cuvée is the layers. It has more layers. It doesn't. Um, it still has the intensity, um, but it lingers so mm -hmm. much more. Mm -hmm. So I get um, a freshness, mm -hmm. up, and actually I get more of the floral quality in in the taste yes. from yes. the acacia yes. wood, and um, just a warmth and a richness and a, a, a texture on the palate. I really think it's a, a, a beautiful wine, a very oh, subtle wine, I and I, I tasted it last night, and I, I did my tasting note, and I sent it to Emily, and I said, Emily, there's more to this wine yes. than I've described in, in, in the tasting note. Uh, and we tried again today to, to, to define what it was that was intriguing. Yeah. And it's very, very difficult. But if I had to taste these two wines blind, uh, I know I would say this is the wine, the, the cuvee would be the wine that would be my choice. But you know, everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody's different. And everybody has a different reference, frame of reference. And what you could say about both these wines is they're both beautiful. But yes. the innovative aspects of the Cuvée wine are just absolutely uh, unique. And I also, I'll chime in on what you're saying where it's, it's a, a, I'm not going to say it's confusing, but we've all grown up drinking oaked Chardonnays mm. or oaked mm. Viognes, mm. and we have a, a vocabulary to talk about oak. Yes. You know, toasty, nutty, yeah, uh, yeah. caramel. Yeah. Um, Coconut. But nobody clove. really has yeah. a lexicon to talk about acacia. acacia. Mm -hmm. um, and again, um, for those of you that missed the whole tree segment of this um, live stream, uh, acacia is actually black locust, which is completely indigenous to um, the southeastern United States, including Virginia. And we have quite a lot of it on the farm so yeah. it, it, it's it's no surprise actually to me once I realized that that they match so well yes indeed. together and, and actually we did state previously that the, it's the, the acacia allows the expression of the grape uh, yeah. which is not confused by the influence of, uh, of oak and right. oak can sort of in a way take away the the, the, the the wonderful fruit character mm. that Emily's been able to capture in this cuvee, and I I just think it's a super wine. May I ask you a question? Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, what about the wine club? Um, they would love to know a little bit more of a narrative in the box. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So that's something we've been working on, especially. Um, with a little bit more time on our computers in the new COVID world. Um, but yes, we're, we're starting to put together a series of cards um, to start to explain, especially with the Cuvées or the Momentarius collection, specifically our, our mm -hmm. thoughts and our ideas behind yeah. these yeah. wines. And we're, we're hoping that uh, very soon, if you're in the wine club, you can go to the website and you can just click on uh, and get a video of yes. Emily and I discussing Momentarius or cuvee or whatsoever. Short little tidbits just to give you a, a live version. Of just for the wine club. Mm -hmm. Just for the wine club. And that's the joys of being in the wine club. Yes, absolutely. One of the many, right? One of the many. So we have another. Um, the two wines here have very different colors. The 2018 is a deeper, more vibrant color. Yep. And the, the cuvee is slightly lighter hue. Just yes. curious in Emily's experience, how much of that is due to the vintage? 100%. <laughs> okay, and then the other question was how much is due to stainless versus the acacia. Okay, so, and I'm not sure if everybody can hear Becca behind the camera, but the basic question was there's a big difference in color between these wines, and that is 100% vintage. Um, so you would actually, and I, I said to Andrew earlier, let's not talk about the color <laughs> because it's confusing. Um, you should, the older vintage wine should be more colored, more hued. Um, but the 2018 vintage was, it was an anomaly for us. Yes. And I did notice from the start that we were getting more color on these skins and more color in the fermentation than I was used to. And so that will be, um, for me and for Veritas, just an indicator of the 2018 yeah. vintage. The, the barrel fermented Club Cuvée should have more color, and it will when we compare it to other vintages in the future. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually some some literature to, to suggest that <clears throat> using black locust, which is acacia, actually colors the wine more mm -hmm. 
than if you use standard oak. But disregard that. And this is yes, this is <laughs> this is this is the joy of, of, of doing wines because the the club cuvee this afternoon is almost this evening is almost an anomaly. Uh, you know, there's so many things that that you know in general are true, but when you get down to it, there's always this exception. And that's what I love about Virginia and growing grapes here mm -hmm. um, is that every year. I get handed another chapter in a book, and I and but I learn something from each of those chapters and um, add it to kind of the the repertoire and the learning experience as a as a winery and as a winemaker. Do we have any more questions, Becca? Um, let's see. Which VNA vintage is maturing soon that you're the most excited about? Mm, most excited about. I would say seventeen. Seventeen yeah. is a is a what was a beautiful vintage. Um, Nineteen just went into the bottle last month. Um, we and haven't released it yet. We have not released it yet. So I'd say seventeen and nineteen were two really strong um, posts in our in our catalog of good vintages. Mm -hmm. There were two very strong vintages. Right, right. And you know, there's a lot of controversy about. Should one actually age a Viognier? And yeah. you always said, nah, <laughs> no, just drink it. I, I, I like Viognier for its freshness and mm -hmm. its, its vivacity. But then we did a tasting of old Viogniers. And they were lovely. And they were lovely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the, the, the acid sort of transformed into sort of honey and, and, and nuts? Yep. So it, it comes very sort fig. of. In fig. Oh, yep. it's absolutely. Uh, yep. Very much like a Chenin Blanc. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Well, I think we have, I, I really enjoyed your interaction this evening. It's made our uh, tasting much more um, enjoyable. real. Yes, yeah. enjoyable and real. And um, we look forward to our next tasting, which we actually haven't formulated yet, but we'll let you know as soon as we do. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed these two wines. If you have any further questions, please let email us. us. Um, and whatever you do, Please stay safe. Yes. Oh, and remember if you have a glass of wine in each hand. You can't touch your face. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>